Oh, hi there. While you're online looking for lost media, I would suggest getting Surfshark, the sponsor of today's video. Surfshark is a VPN that keeps your online identity private in a world that is dead set on keeping track of your every move. It keeps you safe on public Wi-Fi, secures online banking, and even secures your cryptocurrency for all Dogecoin investments. But the biggest thing for me is that Surfshark gives you access to streaming libraries worldwide. Platforms like Netflix have 15 different content libraries depending on where you live. Surfshark allows you to take full advantage of your subscription and watch content regardless of your location. If you're using Netflix in the US, this means you can watch shows like Rick and Morty, It's Always Sunny, Top Gear, and Doctor Who, all shows that Netflix has locked to specific regions outside the US. Whether you're on the hunt for lost media or just looking to take full advantage of your streaming services, Surfshark is the way to go. Click the link in the description and enter the code ATL to get 83% off Surfshark and an extra three months for free. I think of all lost media as a missing piece of history, but today I want to talk about the media that had a major impact on the world that for whatever reason has gone missing. Big shout out to Thomas for suggesting I make this video. Nearly all of my videos are made because of fan suggestions, so leave your ideas for future videos in the comments or find me on Twitter at Lost Media Mike. So here are 10 pieces of historical lost media. Late Night Lineup was a British TV show on BBC Two airing from 1964 to 1972. On Friday, September 19, 1969, the show had a groundbreaking 33-minute episode devoted to the Beatles' upcoming album, Abbey Road. The episode was made in collaboration with the Beatles, featuring shortened versions of the album's songs, all set to music videos. This is one of the earliest known examples of an album being represented as a music video. The show aired twice, September 19th and October 10th, and since then, no full recording has surfaced. This makes the exact contents of the show unclear, but based on some of the surviving clips and from people who actually saw the episode over 50 years ago, it was made up of a combination of dancers, animations, stock footage, art house style films, and footage of the Beatles. The show was long thought to have been lost, save for a few clips, but in 2019, Dig Media posted clips of the episode on Twitter that appear to be taken from a recording of a black and white TV, claiming to have a full recording of the show and are currently working on a restoration, though progress has slowed since the pandemic. Until they release what they have, we can't know how much and how well this groundbreaking episode is preserved. Okay, football fans, put your hands together for the Bikini Bottom Super Bowl! Before becoming the massively popular staple of American culture, the Super Bowl was called the AFL-NFL World Championship Game, pitting the two major leagues of American football against each other. These early championship games were seen as another bowl game with no major significance, so they were broadcast on TV, but not well preserved. The 1967 championship, later named Super Bowl I, was between the Green Bay Packers and the Kansas City Chiefs and was believed to have been lost until the NFL was able to stitch together the game from archive footage and finally showed the game again in 2016. But Super Bowl II wasn't so lucky. The 1968 game between the Green Bay Packers and the Oakland Raiders was not preserved by the NFL, who claimed to only have footage from the game's highlights. Though the game wasn't as popular as it is today, it still reached over 39 million homes in the US. But to further complicate the search, late into the second quarter of the game, 80% of the country briefly lost the feed from CBS, blaming a breakdown in AT&T's cable lines. So even if someone was to come forward with a very unlikely home recording, it would probably be missing a good chunk of the game. For years after airing, it was thought to be completely lost except for a few photos featured in Sports Illustrated, but the NFL eventually showed their handful of clips from the highlights, and recreations have been made using the entire unedited audio track, likely taken from a radio broadcast. This recreation was taken down by YouTube, but others are still online if you look hard enough. <laughs> Abraham Lincoln once said that if you're a racist, I will attack you with the North. On May 29, 1856, future President of the United States Abraham Lincoln gave a speech at the Anti-Nebraska Convention in Bloomington, Illinois, an event that culminated in the founding of the state's Republican Party. The speech was 90 minutes long, Lincoln used no notes, and while he's known for giving great speeches such as his Gettysburg Address, this speech is considered one of his greatest. The only thing is, no one knows what he said. The legend goes that Lincoln's speech was so enthralling that reporters were too mesmerized to write down his speech, putting down their pen and paper to focus on his words. One eyewitness said, I threw my pen and paper away and lived only in the inspiration of the hour. The same eyewitness claims, His speech was full of fire and energy and force. It was logic, it was pathos, it was enthusiasm, it was justice, equality, truth, and right set ablaze by divine fires of a maddened soul by the wrong. 
It was hard, heavy, naughty, gnarly, backed with wrath. It should be noted that this eyewitness was William Herndon, who is both a political and personal friend of Lincoln's, and his words are probably a little biased. A popular theory stemming from Herndon's biography on Lincoln is that the speech was a harsh condemnation of slavery, and that reporters intentionally lost the transcripts of the speech in an attempt to avoid anti-slavery language that might further divide the country. Fragments of the speech were reported in various publications from eyewitness accounts, but nothing that can be verified. Edward Leon Scott de Martinsville was a French inventor who created the earliest known sound recording device, the phone autograph, in 1857. Scott created the device by mimicking human auditory anatomy in a way that the sound could be transferred into a visual representation pressed into wood or paper in hopes that the sound waves could be read like a book. They of course can't, and because the device only created a visual representation of the sound, it was never actually intended to play back. But in 2008, phone autograph etchings were found in a Paris archive and through modern technology were able to be converted into actual sound. The two most famous recordings are of Scott singing a French folk tune in 1860, making it the oldest known recognizable recording of singing, predating Edison's phonograph recordings by 28 years, and his 1860 recording of the opening lines of the play Amanita, which is the earliest known recording of intelligible speech. There's a long-standing rumor that Scott traveled to the United States in the 1860s and recorded the voice of Abraham Lincoln speaking on his opinion of slavery. If true, this would be the first recording of a United States president, predating Edison's recording of Rutherford B. Hayes. There's no actual evidence this ever happened, or that Scott was even in the United States in the 1860s. Scott would spend 20 years of his life recording sounds to his invention, and it seems that all of his visual representations of sound have been preserved, but some of the recordings seem to be damaged beyond repair, meaning that we may never hear his complete works, and some of the world's earliest recordings might be lost forever. When talking about historic lost media, I have to include one of the hundreds of lost silent films, and this is one of my favorites. Snow White was a 1916 adaptation of the 1912 play, which was in turn based on the old grim fairy tale. The movie starred Margaret Clark as Snow White, and just so you have an idea of how many lost silent films there are, Clark made at least 40 films, and all but 5 are lost, and even some of those 5 have lost sections. Though you've likely never seen the film, it had a major impact on the history of cinema because at age 15, Walt Disney himself saw the film and was so moved that it inspired him to make his own adaptation that would go on to be the first ever feature-length animated film. The movie was thought to be lost forever in a vault fire at Paramount Pictures that destroyed nearly all of Margaret Clark's films, until 1992 when a nitrate print was found in Amsterdam with only a few scenes missing. The film was released on DVD in the historic film collection, Treasures from American Film Archives, 50 preserved films in 2000, but several scenes are still lost. There is supposedly a lost scene where a stork delivers Snow White to her parents that I personally think could have inspired the opening to Dumbo, but of course there's no way to confirm this. You dumb moon! I walked on your face! Don't you know it's day? I've already talked about the moon landing in my Lost Media Iceberg, but I cannot leave it off this list because it is probably one of mankind's most astonishing achievements ever caught on tape and NASA lost it. Well, kind of lost it. You can still find the entire 1969 Apollo 11 moon landing footage, but this version is a much lesser quality than the raw broadcast straight from the moon to NASA. The raw footage wasn't compatible with TV broadcasting standards at the time, and despite the moon landing being an incredibly sophisticated and groundbreaking feat, NASA used the most janky method possible to send the moon footage to TV stations across the world. The signal from the moon was fed to a high quality screen, and with millions of dollars in funding, NASA just pointed a TV friendly camera at the high quality image and called it a day. This would have been fine, but rather than making copies of the high quality footage for future viewing, NASA sent the original 14 inch spools of magnetic tape to the National Recording Center in Maryland in 1970. In the 2000s, NASA began searching for the original footage, but discovered it was missing. They came to the conclusion that in the 80s, NASA needed a ton of magnetic tape for their new satellites that required tape 24 7. So NASA began erasing and reusing old footage, including the footage taken from the moon's Sea of Tranquility. This of course has led to the conspiracy theory that the moon landing is fake, but all other space missions have included much higher quality video, which should put the theories to rest, but of course, it hasn't. The 
The Television Ghost and Piano Lessons were two TV shows that were among the earliest in TV history. The shows were extremely low budget productions that aired live, back to back in the early 30s on experimental TV station W2XAB New York City and its radio station. Piano Lessons aired as both a 30 and 15 minute program and was simply piano lessons given by Professor G. Aldo Raniger. The Television Ghost was likely the very first dramatic TV series in the world and was just a man dressed as a ghost telling ghost stories. Due to its experimental nature and virtually no budget, the show was little more than a radio drama with a camera only pointed at the storyteller's shoulders and face. Usually, even the oldest and most obscure lost media has a chance of being found, but because these shows are so old, aired live, with no evidence of the radio broadcast being recorded, and there is no tech or budget to record the footage, these shows are completely lost with no chance of recovery. The only reason we even know they exist is from a single publicity photo from the television ghost and a few newspaper mentions of the show. During the Ming Dynasty, the Yongle Emperor of China ordered the production of a massive book series that was meant to include all of Chinese literature and knowledge in one place. This massive undertaking would take 9,169 scholars from Nanjing University five years to write, including sections written by experts in the fields of science, medicine, philosophy, geography, history, astronomy, Buddhism, Taoism, the Confucian canon, art, agriculture, technology, and drama. The scholars worked for five years from 1403 to 1408 and the completed text was made up of 11,095 volumes, 22,937 rolls, 370 million Chinese characters, and incorporated over 8,000 ancient texts. This Goliath work was known as the Yongle Encyclopedia and is one of the earliest and largest encyclopedias in the world. The Yongle Emperor was so proud of the work he wrote the preface writing about the importance of preserving the encyclopedia. The books were held in Beijing's Forbidden City, but due to the constant shifting of power in Imperial China, the collection was damaged and lost over the years. To protect the encyclopedia, copies were made, but due to a combination of fires and the Boxer Rebellion from 1899 to 1901, the Forbidden Palace was looted and damaged, leading to the loss of massive sections of the work. Less than 400 volumes are currently found, and the fate of the original copy is completely unknown. Because the volumes were likely looted as late as the 1900s, there is still a hope they'll turn up, but it seems more and more unlikely every day. The 1915 movie The Birth of a Nation is an absolutely vile, racist film that sparked the revival of the KKK and damaged the United States along with the rest of the world for years to come. But Birth of the Nation is a tragically important part of cinema and history. Even though it's a difficult part of history, it shouldn't be shied away from. But at the same time, I refuse to show any clips from this movie that might spread its racist message. So here are videos of black leaders, activists, and icons across all political ideologies that this movie and its sequel attempted to oppress. Upon its release, the movie was the highest grossing film of all time, making an estimated $1.8 billion when adjusted for inflation, sparked riots and protests all across the US, and was the very first movie to be screened in the White House. This disappointing part of cinematic history was followed up by 1916's The Fall of a Nation. Though the film wasn't as successful as its predecessor, becoming both a commercial and critical failure, it's considered to be the first ever film sequel and one of the first movies to include an original orchestral score. The Fall of a Nation saw a hypothetical future where the US is conquered by European invaders and eventually rebel against the occupation, all of this with the highly racist themes of its predecessor. Because the movie was a commercial and critical failure, in an era where film preservation was rare, it has since become entirely lost save for a few stills and its soundtrack that was later found and re-recorded in 1987, and I can't say I'm too broken up about it. Because people have got to know whether or not their president is a crook. Well, I'm not a crook. Just months before the 1972 presidential election, President Richard Nixon infamously conspired to steal campaign documents and illegally wiretap the Democratic National Committee's headquarters at the Watergate complex in Washington, D.C., leading to the Watergate scandal that became the namesake for literally every scandal for years to come and culminated in Nixon's resignation in 1972 due to the impending results of his unwinnable impeachment trial. During the lengthy investigation, Nixon was forced by the Supreme Court to hand over his surprisingly comprehensive records of phone calls and conversations he made in the White House. These now infamous tapes include what would become known as the smoking gun tape that proved without a doubt Nixon was guilty. From these historic tapes, there is an 18 and a half minute segment of the audio that is mysteriously missing. The official story is that Nixon's secretary, Rosemary Woods, accidentally recorded over and erased the 18 and a half minutes while taking a phone call in a move that is now referred to as the Rosemary Stretch. 
But considering the major implications of the tapes, many doubt this explanation, believing that it was another cover-up by Nixon. Former White House Chief of Staff Alexander Haig has since stated that Nixon was spectacularly inept at operating mechanical devices, and that in the process of reviewing the tapes, he might have deleted the 18 and a half minutes intentionally or unintentionally. To me, this leaves three possible explanations. One, Rosemary Woods and the Nixon administration are telling the truth. Two, Nixon didn't understand how the device works and meant to delete the smoking gun tape, but accidentally deleted something else. Or three, he wiped this 18 and a half minute section intentionally to cover up something far greater. With all the heinous things that have come from the Nixon tapes over their slow release, I can't even imagine what he could have possibly been hiding if option three is the truth. Thank you so much for watching, and thanks to Surfshark for sponsoring this video. I've been interested in doing more videos on a single piece of lost media. Let me know what you want me to cover and you might just see it in a future video. This is Mike with All Things Lost. See you soon!